Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to look at the uh, money market and the market for loanable funds as we continue to uh, continue our study of the financial system. And so the purpose for today is to be able to describe the demand and supply within the money market and figure out how to identify equilibrium within that money market and then talk about um, how the loanable funds market is used to determine uh, real interest rates. So we'll start first with the money market and all this information is in chapter 31 of your book. When we're talking about the money market, we're talking about um, short-term access to money. And we start with the question of what is the purpose of carrying cash to begin with? And, and the answer is simply to purchase something with. Uh, money has no real value to it unless it's used to, to uh, purchase goods and services as a medium of exchange. And so if I'm going to carry cash with me, it does come with an opportunity cost. It's not free to carry it in my pocket. If I'm going to carry cash in my pocket, I am losing out on the opportunity uh, to invest it or earn interest on it. And so there's, a, there's an opportunity cost uh, to me of carrying money in my pocket. And that opportunity cost is the interest rate that I could be receiving on that money. The result then is um, a, essentially a downward sloping demand for money. If the interest rate is lower, then I'm giving up less to carry cash in my pocket, so I'll be willing to carry more. And if the interest rate is higher, it's more expensive to me to carry cash in my pocket because I could be getting um, my, a return on that cash by leaving it in the bank. And so a higher interest rate means I'll, I'll demand less money, or the quantity demanded will be less um, than if the interest rates were lower. When it comes to the supply of money, what we find is that the supply is fixed in the short run by the Federal Reserve. And so when we draw it in the, the graph, it's going to be a vertical line. And it's fixed no matter what the interest rate is. The Federal Reserve determines what money supply should be, and that's what it is. When we put the supply of money together with the demand for money, we get the money market. And the intersection of those two lines will tell us the interest rate in the money market. For our purposes, we're going to say that's the federal funds rate. Within the money market, we're going to assume that these are short-run interest rates. These are short-term interest rates um, that are being charged. We're going to agree that they're determined by supply and demand, which is how everything in economic markets works. And we're going to assume that the opportunity cost of carrying money is, in fact, the interest rate, which is what we said earlier, and that there is no inflation um, at all and because it's short term and so there's no opportunity for inflation to exist and also that the money supply is fixed in the short run by the Federal Reserve. And so based on those assumptions we can put together the money market and find the current interest rate. When we put the two together the money market looks something like this with uh, the interest rate on the vertical axis we're going to call this the real interest rate or R and then on the horizontal axis is going to be the quantity of money. Where the money supply and money demand curves intersect is our equilibrium point, and that would tell us our equilibrium interest rate. The market, as we've said before, tends towards equilibrium, and that's where it's happiest. Um, we could think through a thought exercise and say, if the interest rate were actually higher than equilibrium, if, say, the interest rate was at RH, we would find at that place the quantity demanded of money is going to be less than the quantity supplied. In essence, there's too much money in the system at that interest rate. If that were the case, we would head towards equilibrium because in order to get rid of this excess supply of money, uh, banks would, would basically have to um, entice people to want to carry cash by lowering the cost to the consumer, by lowering the interest rate, which would lower the opportunity cost of carrying cash and encourage people to demand more uh, more money or increase the quantity of money demanded and that would lead people back down until we would get this equilibrium point at point E again. If the interest rate were actually below equilibrium, say at RL, then in that situation we'd find that the quantity of money supplied would be less than the quantity demanded. We would have a shortage of money and what would happen is people would be willing to pay a higher price to access money, to borrow money. Um, they'd be willing to pay a higher interest rate and they would essentially bid each other up until people would would uh, would cease to want to to carry money again because the price is too high for them until we get to this equilibrium point where the quantity demanded equals the quantity supplied. So it's the same kind of equilibrium story 
that we said earlier when we started looking at the basics of supply and demand. What would cause a shift in demand? Um, there are two main things that we're going to look at as far as what would shift the demand for money. The first is that there could be a change in aggregate price levels within the overall economy. If things are more expensive, then um, it would take more money to be able to buy the same amount of goods. So an increase in price level would lead to an increased need or demand for money. It doesn't matter how much I'd have to pay to access the money, how much I'd have to pay to borrow. The fact is that I would need more of it. So in a case where aggregate price levels were rising, we'd see a shift in the money demand curve to the right. And if prices were dropping, we'd see an opposite effect. And we can look at changes in real GDP as well. If the economy is getting larger and real GDP is greater and there's more output being produced, then that would mean that people's incomes have risen. If people's incomes have risen, then um, they're going to consume more. And with more consumption comes a need for more money. And so we would see a shift to the right in the demand for money in this situation as well. And the opposite would be true. If GDP was falling, we wouldn't need as much. Demand for money would shift to the left. And when it comes to shifts in supply, we're going to assume that, again, the money supply is set by the Federal Reserve through the Open Market Committee. They're going to set a target interest rate that determines what interest rate they want to see in the market, and then they're going to adjust money supply to meet it. So, for example, if the Federal Reserve wanted to see the interest rate drop from R1 to R2, then the Federal Reserve would increase the money supply to ensure that the new equilibrium point in the money market would be at that interest rate that they've set as the target. And we'll talk more about these decisions that the Open Market Committee makes later when we talk about monetary policy. The next thing we want to look at is the loanable funds market, and that's the market for loans. And all that information is also in your, in your textbook in Chapter 26. In the loanable funds market, we find that the price of loans is the real interest rate that people have to, uh, to pay. So this is going to incorporate the idea of inflation. And like with the money market and other, every other market in economics, the price of loans, the interest rate, will be determined by supply and demand. And if we were to draw out the market, we would have interest rates on the vertical axis and the quantity of loanable funds on the horizontal. When it comes to the demand for loanable funds, it's going to be based on a rate of return. Um, we said that investment happens when um, the rate of return is equal to or greater than the price of borrowing. So what we see is a downward sloping demand curve, like everything else. If the interest rate is high, then there are very few projects with a rate of return equal to that high interest rate, and so there'll be less of a need for loanable funds. As the interest rate drops, then more projects become profitable and therefore there is a greater need for loanable funds. So as interest rates drop, more funds are needed to downward sloping demand curve. When it comes to the supply of loans, um, the supply of loans represents foregone consumption. If you're not spending, you're saving. If you're saving money in the banking system, it's available to be lent. And so if the interest rate on loans is higher, that means you get more money back if you are lending your money to somebody else. And so there is a greater incentive for people with higher interest rates to save more of their money because they have an opportunity to get a greater return when they lend it out. And so we see an upward sloping supply curve. So if the interest rate goes from 4% to 12%, that means that people are getting more return on the money that they're saving in the bank and lending to other people, and so they'll be willing to, to save more money. When we put the two together, we get the equilibrium interest rate. And just like with every other graph we've looked at with supply and demand, we know that if the interest rate is above equilibrium, then we would have a greater supply of loanable funds than is demanded. In that situation, um, we would have to lower the interest rate in order to encourage people to take advantage of the supply of funds that are available and we would see interest rates begin to drop until we got to equilibrium. And if the equilibrium price was higher than the current interest rate, that is if the interest rate were 4%, then we would have a shortage. There's not enough loanable funds supplied to meet the amount demanded and people would have to bid the price up 
to try and get to the equilibrium point as people competed against each other, being, being willing to pay a little bit more in order to access the limited amount of loanable funds available in the market. When we talk about the loanable fund market, we want to see what's going to cause a shift in demand. And what we see is that the demand for loanable funds changes when either there are a, there is a change in the business opportunities that the market presents or if the government is borrowing more or less. If, for example, in business opportunities improve or the government is borrowing more, we would see a shift in demand. An improving economy means I think that I'm going to be able to get a greater rate of return uh, tomorrow than I, I do today, which means that it makes sense to borrow money uh, in order to do it, and demand would shift to the right. And if there was a downturn to business opportunities or the government needed to borrow less, we would see a left shift in the, the demand for loanable funds and we'd see a drop and the overall interest rate. The supply of loanable funds is going to shift when either there's more savings, which means there's more money available for banks to lend, or if there are capital inflows, meaning if people from other countries think that they can get a better rate of return here in America on their money uh, being lent out, then that's what they're going to do, in which case there would be more funds available to be lent. So if we see an increase in private savings or money flowing in from other countries into the United States, we would see a right shift in supply and a reduction in the interest rate. And if the opposite were true, we would see the supply shift to the left and interest rates would rise. These two markets, the money market and the loanable funds market, work together. That is to say that changes in money supply will affect the interest rate in both the money market and the loanable funds market. Um, so in the short run, if we were going to increase money supply, we would see a, uh, a reduction in the interest rate from R1 down to R2. The increased money supply in the economy because of the money multiplier is going to create more M1. Um, they're going to increase the money supply. That means there's more money in the banks. There's uh, more money being saved than before. So the supply of loanable funds should also increase or shift to the right, moving us from an interest rate of R1 down to an interest rate of R2 with more loanable funds being lent out than before. In the long run, however, what we're going to see is that this change in interest rates given an increase in money supply actually undoes itself. That is, that changes in money supply in the long run will lead us back to the original interest rate when things are left alone. And here's why. The increased amount of investment that went on because interest rates fell, making investment opportunities more profitable, leads to an increase in GDP, which is what we knew from a couple of units before. Because there's an increase in GDP, it means that uh, we have more income than we had before, which means we're going to be consuming more than we did before. As a result, the demand that we have for money is going to increase or shift us to the right. And when it does, it's going to move the interest rates back up to a, a higher level, back to the original R1. When the interest rates begin to rise, then eventually, though, in the long run, the increase in GDP um, begins to shift itself back as the economy recorrects itself uh, because there's now increasing costs. There are probably higher wages and other things. Um, and with the increase in price level, things cost more than they did before. So there's less money available for savings than there was before because you have to pay more now. And so we see the supply of loanable funds shift back to the left, bringing us back to the higher interest rate of R1. So in the short run, an increase in money supply can affect interest rates. In the long run, a change in money supply has no effect on long run interest rates. We'll look at this again in class. You've got a problem set to work on, and I'll be happy to answer questions when I see you.